turned to heaven and spoke into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my
Jesus been houses or land I'd rather be led by his nail pierced hand than to be the king of a vast in our lives than anything that this world or anybody can offer us. We welcome you to our Sunday morning service again at WPC in Grand Falls, Windsor. We're so glad that you could join us. And uh, those of you that are watching online, again, we extend to you a warm welcome. And we're so glad that you're tuned in. And uh, we're looking forward to what God is going to say to us again today through the worship, through the preaching of his word, and that's coming up in a little while after we do a little bit more worship. Again, we, uh, we especially thank those of you that are maybe, maybe it's your first time you know, checking this church out, or maybe you've seen it each and every week that we've been on the year, but we are so thankful that all of you were able to join with us this morning. And again, we give all of you a warm welcome. I'm going to pray for you as we do each and every Sunday morning. Pray for your needs. Pray for your family. Pray for your children, your loved ones. Maybe someone who's a little bit anxious. Maybe somebody who has a need in their life. And uh, we believe that we still serve a God that's able to meet every need. A healing God. A God that's still sitting on his throne. A God that's in control. 
So again, would you pray with me this morning as we do each and every Sunday and allow God's Spirit to, to just uplift us, to allow God's Spirit to move in our lives. Father, we thank you today again for this privilege of coming to worship you. And we thank you for everyone that's watching and everyone that will watch maybe later today or later this week. And Father, I pray that the Spirit of the living God would just move in people's homes right where they are. You know their need today. Father, you know what their family's needs are, their neighbor's needs are, their parents' needs are, their friends' and loved ones' needs are again today. We pray for those that are struggling today. We pray for those who need a touch of God upon their life. And Father, I pray that the peace of God that you spoke about in your word would just fill their homes, fill their lives, fill their hearts. Father, I pray for the service. I pray for the preaching of your word that will happen in a little while. I pray that there will be freedom in this place, that you would move in the midst of your people. And Father, I just pray that we would hear testimonies to the goodness of God and how you spoke into people's lives, not just this day, but in the weeks and the months that lie ahead, Lord. So we just give you glory in this place. We pray in Jesus' name together. Amen. There's a peace I come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor And there's an anchor for my soul And I can say it is well And Jesus
grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead, and I will rise when He calls my name. No more so. Your eyes. 
Christ in heaven. There is freedom. Freedom raised in this place. Good morning, folks. Pastor Jeff Ryan here again, coming to you from Windsor Pentecostal Church in Grand Falls, Windsor, Newfoundland, and Labrador. Thank you once again for joining us for our time of worship and the Word. I want to express a special thanks to Rogers Television for granting us the great privilege of being able to come to you into your homes, on your TVs, by way of their uh, community channel. It's such an honor and a privilege that we do not take for granted. So a shout out to Rogers TV for giving us this opportunity. I also want to express thanks to our worship team again this morning uh, for the great job in leading us in worship. Worship is a very important part of what we do, music and vocals, and we certainly thank the Lord uh, for the gifts that he's given to our people to be able to share that and lead us in worship. It's a privilege as well this morning to be able to bring you a message from God's Word once again today. Our message, our text today is taken from the first letter of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians in chapter 15, verses 9 to 10. I will read those verses in a moment, but before I do, allow me to put them in context for us. 1 Corinthians 15 is one off, if not the most important chapters in all of Paul's New Testament writings. It's important because it deals with the central doctrine of the Christian faith, and that is the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead and the eventual resurrection of all who die in Christ. That is our hope, to be raised one day uh, when Jesus returns. Paul begins chapter 15 by declaring a matter of fact, something that's a matter of fact, and that is that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and was raised on the third day. That was a matter of fact. Paul then proceeds to lay out proof that Jesus was resurrected by mentioning people that personally saw Jesus after he was raised from the dead. In verse 6 and the first part of verse 7, he says that the post-resurrected Jesus appeared to Peter, appeared to a group that he calls the Twelve, appeared to a, a larger group of 500 people, appeared to James, and appeared to all the disciples, Paul says. In the first part of verse 8, Paul says that last of all, Jesus appeared to him. He puts himself last. He says, and last of all, Jesus appeared to him. Then in the last part of verse 8 and the first part of verse 9, Paul proceeds to use some critical language to describe himself. He tells his readers that he considered himself to be the least of the apostles. And he did not deserve to be called one of the apostles. Least of the, of the apostles and didn't deserve even to have that title. In the last part of verse 9, Paul then explains why he felt that way about himself. And it was because back in the day, he was a persecutor of the church of God. Let me park there just for a moment before we look at today's text. The story of Paul's severe treatment of the early Christians first appears in the book of Acts chapter 7. During a time of severe persecution, a man by the name of Stephen was being stoned to death for basically preaching the gospel. Luke, who was the author of the book of Acts, tells us that as the people were stoning Stephen to death, they actually laid their clothes at the feet of a young man. That young man's name was Saul. And he was there giving approval to his death. 
So this young man Saul seemed to have some level of authority. And he was approving what these people were doing, putting Stephen to death for preaching the gospel. And from that day onward, the persecution of the early Christians got ramped up. And again, one of the leaders behind it was this so-called young man named Saul. In Acts chapter 9, we read that one day, Saul went to the Jewish high priest. He did so to request a letter to be given to him that he could give to the synagogues in a city called Damascus. And this letter would give him permission to imprison all those who were followers of Jesus. And let me tell you, imprisonment was only a part of the persecution. In most cases, Christians were beaten. Uh, they were, again, thrown in prison. And in most cases, they were murdered. They were killed. Great persecution. And that's what Saul wanted to do. So he brought his letters, or he took the letter, uh, asking for that permission. Uh, and with letter in hand, uh, he, he began his trip to the city of Damascus. Well, God had a different plan for this man named Saul. You see, God had a purpose beyond what Saul could even understand at that point in time. In Acts chapter 9, verses 3 to 10, we read that as Saul neared Damascus, he had a miraculous encounter with the resurrected Jesus. Now, I don't, I don't have time this morning to go into all the details of that encounter or that, the events of that day. But sufficient to say, it was an encounter that changed Saul's life. And over a course of a, a few days and, and more experiences with God, Saul's name was actually changed to Paul, indicative of the change that took place in his life. The man who was known as a murderer of Christians began a spiritual journey that eventually resulted in him being called by God to be an apostle. And outside of Jesus, he became known as the greatest Christian missionary who ever lived. Well, that's Paul's story in a nutshell. And it's certainly a powerful one. Now, please come back to me, with me rather, to, to today's scripture in 1 Corinthians 15. In verse 9, Paul makes reference to himself as once being a persecutor of the church of God but is now being called one of the apostles. He is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is now a leader in the church that he once persecuted. Think about that. A murderer of Christians, now he becomes one of their greatest advocates. He becomes one of God's greatest missionaries, preaching the gospel, founding churches throughout Asia Minor at the time, and, and people, seeing people come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What a change. Paul would shout amen, I'm sure, to the writer uh, who penned the words of this old chorus that we sometimes sing. Oh, what a change, what a difference when you have an encounter with God. You see, life takes on a new meaning when you have an encounter with God. And that was certainly Paul's experience. His life was changed for time and for eternity. Now in verse 10, which is today's text, Paul gives his readers the key to the change that came about in his life. Just listen to what he says. He says, it is by the grace of God that I am what I am. It is by the grace of God that I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, he said, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Folks, no less than three times in this one verse of Scripture does Paul refer to the grace of God as being the key to his spiritual transformation and his success as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, I believe this morning that the word grace is the most beautiful word in the Christian faith, if not the entire English language. Say it with me. Grace. Grace. It's a beautiful word. It has a hopeful and soothing ring to it, doesn't it? Grace. 
Folks, I believe John Newton was right when he referred to God's grace as amazing. He wrote that hymn that we, we all know, know, I'm sure. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. John's experience with God and grace led him to write that hymn, Amazing Grace. But what's so amazing about God's grace? Well, this morning, I want to begin what will probably be a, a two- or three-part message that addresses this great question, what's so amazing about God's grace? The first amazing thing about grace that I want to look at this morning and it's the only one we will look at. There are a number of things that are amazing about grace, but the first and only one we will address this morning is that it's by God's grace that we are saved. It is by God's grace that we are saved. In other words, it is by God's grace, His amazing grace, that we can be forgiven of our sins. In Acts 15 and verse 11, we read that the apostles believed that it was through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that they were saved. The greatest, and I believe the, the, the scripture that gives full expression to this great truth that we are saved by grace is found in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. And if you have your Bibles, you want to, read, want to turn there, Ephesians 2 and verse 8. Again, the Apostle Paul is the writer, and he's been talking to the Christians in the city of Ephesus this time, and he's talking to them about the wonderful gift of salvation. The first thing he does is he compares what the believers were like before they received God's plan of salvation provided to them through Jesus Christ. Paul uses words and phrases that are probably not used as much today to describe their spiritual condition outside of Christ. And he says like, things like they were dead in trespasses and sins. He says by nature they were deserving the wrath or the judgment of God. Folks, that's strong language. But it is truthful language. Outside of Christ we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are deserving of the wrath and the judgment of God. Of God. That's what they were before Jesus. Then Paul makes the transition from what the believers once were before Christ to what they are now. He uses one small word to make the transition, and is that word but. Again, listen to what he says. He says, But God. So he's been talking about their spiritual state, dead in trespasses and sins deserving of the wrath and the judgment of God. And then he says, But God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in sins. It is by grace you have been saved, he says. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. What a powerful testimony of what God has done for all who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul just expresses it in such a clear and powerful way. We were dead, he says, in our sins. But we have been made alive. And then he says, it is by the grace of God that you have been saved. These two verses sums up the entire view of how God's grace works and what it does. And he interjects right in the middle of that one message, it is by God's grace that you have been saved. Well, in verse 8, he expands on this statement by giving us the greatest expression of, of we are saved by grace in the entire Bible. Just listen again to what he says. For it is by grace you have been saved. He makes that statement in the previous verse as a little bit of an interjection, but now he expands on it. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. What does Paul mean here when he refers to being saved? Well, what he is talking about here has to do with the people being rescued from the fate that they would otherwise experience. The spiritual fate, the spiritual destiny 
that they were de deserving of before they knew Christ. The fate that they would experience without Christ. What was that fate? I need to remind us this morning that because of our sinfulness, and the Bible says we were born in sin, because of that sin, we deserve nothing less than eternity in hell. It's an unpopular message. It's one that some of you may not even appreciate hearing this morning. But in, outside of Christ, in our sinfulness, we deserve nothing less than eternity in hell. Separated from the presence of God, which, my friends, is spiritual death. And it is painful beyond what any man or woman can ever imagine today. Over the years, I've been asked this question. Pastor, do you believe there's a literal place called hell for those who reject Christ? Do you really believe it? Without hesitation, my answer has always been, yes, I do. The Bible teaches it. We must not ignore it. Then a follow-up question is often asked as well. It is this, do you believe that place called hell as literal fire? And so many people get caught up in that. And Do you believe that hell has literal fire? Again, without hesitation, my answer has always been yes. I do. But folks, my answer is still the same, but let me say something that some of you have heard me say before, and that is the greatest source of suffering in hell, I believe, is not in the flames of hell. The greatest suffering of hell is the fact that those who end up there will be eternally separated from God. You know, we can experience the pain of fire, we could have some understanding of that. But we could never understand what it means to be fully separated from God. You see, even here in this world, in our state of sinfulness, if we're outside of Christ, we still can't understand or grasp what it means to be totally, absolutely, eternally separated from God. To be separated from all that is loving, all that is kind, all that is gracious, to be separated from the light of God's glorious presence, to experience complete darkness and lostness of soul is something that we can't understand today. But that is what hell is like. Totally, absolutely cut off from the presence, the goodness, the love and the grace of Almighty God. That's the bad news. But there's good news today. And that good news is this, that rescue is possible. Rescue from this terrible fate is possible today for all who come to know Jesus Christ. And, and this is expressed in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Let me read it to you again. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. I want to take just a few minutes to unpack these verses a little this morning. I want to do it by working backward in the text. The first thing I want to highlight is that our salvation, our rescue from sin and eternal separation from God has nothing to do with us. My salvation has nothing to do with me. In the last part of verse 8 and verse 9, uh, Paul says that salvation is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not by works so that no one can boast. What Paul is saying here is that there is absolutely nothing. There are no efforts. There's no amount of money. There's no amount of good behavior. There's no amount of church attendance or church involvement even. There's no acts of kindness that we could ever do that can earn us or bring us salvation. We need to understand that because some people miss that. Some people believe that the more good things they do, the more money they give, the better they are as a person, then they can be saved. It doesn't work that way. You see, if there was something we could do to save ourselves, we would hold our heads up in pride with an attitude of arrogant self-sufficiency. And that is not God's way. God's way 
is a way of humility because there's nothing we can ever do to save us. Salvation is all a matter of God's gift to us. And there's no room, absolutely no room, for any human being to boast because no human being can save themselves. The second thing that I want to look at then is how God's gift of salvation is given to us. If we can't earn it, if we can't buy it, if we can't live good enough on our own to receive it, if we can't attend church enough to receive it, if we can't give enough money, like I said, how can we be saved? Very simple. It is by the grace of God. Paul said, it is by grace you have been saved. The grace of Almighty God. What is meant by the grace of God? The simple definition of grace that most of us would be familiar with this morning is that God is, grace is God's undeserved favor to sinful individuals. God's undeserved favor to sinful people. We will expand on that definition in a few minutes, but, but for now I want you to keep it in mind. The undeserved favor of God to sinful people. Folks, the doctrine of God's grace is fundamental to Christianity. And Christianity cannot be understood without some understanding of grace. Furthermore, it is a doctrine of grace, the undeserved favor of God, that sets Christianity apart from every other religion and cult in the world. Folks, it was the grace of God that transformed Paul's life. It was the grace of God that took him from a road that was leading to hell to a road that was leading to heaven. And as we will see in this message and the subsequent messages on this subject is the amazing grace of God that transforms our lives as well. The Bible teaches us that God's grace has been revealed to us in the person of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 14, we read those words. The Word, referring to Jesus, He became flesh and, and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Titus 2 and 11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. The reference to the grace of God appearing here is a reference to the first coming of Jesus to the earth. Folks, as you know, and I trust you believe, Jesus was God in human flesh and the complete and full revelation of God's amazing grace to us. The Bible also teaches that God's grace was, was expressed to the world through Jesus' death on the cross where he gave his life as a sacrifice for our sins, resulting in our salvation. That's how God's grace was expressed. It was expressed to Jesus as he hung on the cross. Saving grace, then, is the generous provision of salvation by God through his son Jesus, through his death on the cross of Calvary. It is God's undeserved favor to sinful men. As I said, that's a simple, concise definition of grace. There are many other definitions. I personally like what J.I. Packer wrote, a great Christian theologian. He wrote on grace, and he defined grace this way, the saving grace of God. He says, grace is God's love in action towards people who deserve only the opposite of love. Grace means God moving heaven and earth to save sinners who could not lift a finger to save themselves. Grace means God sending His only Son to die on the cross and descend into hell that we guilty ones might be brought into a personal relationship with God and eventually received into heaven. What a beautiful definition of the amazing grace of God. You see, the terms salvation and grace are virtually synonymous. You can't be saved without God's amazing grace. 
One writer said that God's grace is not merely a part of the plan of salvation, but it is a silver cord that runs through every facet of that plan. Folks, the central message of the gospel is that when we receive God's free gift of salvation that is available to all through his amazing grace, we are saved and we have the hope of eternal life now and forevermore in the presence of the Lord. That is what Paul means in our text when he says we are saved by grace through faith, not from ourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. One writer said that grace is entirely the work of God, unprompted by any person, undeserved by anyone, and without regard for anything any recipient of grace will later accomplish. Let me read that again. Grace is entirely the work of God, unprompted by any person, and undeserved by any person, and is something that we could never receive or accomplish on our own. We are saved through the amazing grace of God. As I clue up this morning, I started this message by talking about the spiritual transformation that Paul experienced when he encountered Jesus Christ. It changed him from a murderer to a missionary. Another place in his writings, Paul said that he was the chief of sinners. In other words, he was the worst of the worst. However, he was changed, he was saved, he was transformed, and he acknowledged that this transformation and this salvation wasn't of anything that he had ever done. In fact, in his mind, when it comes to Christ, he did nothing good, but it was through the grace of Almighty God. He said, it's by God's grace that I am what I am. Many of us can say the same thing this morning. Many of you listening today can look back at a time when when you were a sinner and you were drifting further and further away from God. Your lifestyle, your deeds, your attitudes, your actions was indicative of a life that was away from God. But somewhere, sometime, Jesus got a hold of your life. You open up your heart to him and he changed you from the inside through the amazing grace of God. And today, many of you could say, you are what you are by the grace of God. I am what I am by the amazing grace of God. Let me ask some questions this morning as I wrap this up. You're listening today, and do you need a change in your life? Do you need some, a, a spiritual transformation? Do you need to be walking a different road As you look at your life, as you look at the future, if you believe in heaven and hell, do you believe in right now, if you died today, that you would go to be with Jesus? Do you need a change in your life? Do you need to be saved? Do you need a change of heart, a change of mind? If you answer yes to those questions, I declare to you today that you can be changed. You can be saved. There's no respect of persons with God. You cannot go far enough in sin that he cannot find you and deliver you. I heard one fellow say one time, sin will take you further than you ever intended to go and it will keep you there longer than you ever intended to stay. Well, let me tell you, the grace of God can find you and pull you back from the abyss of eternal separation from God, the edge of the precipice of that abyss that leads to eternal separation from God. Grace can pull you back and change you, make you over anew. John Newton was known to be a wicked sinner, a thief, a scoundrel, probably a murderer. I'm not sure of all the details. I I can't remember all the details of his life that I've read, but a great sinner. Jesus got a hold of his life. And he wrote these words, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Friend, today, you can have that same experience. It may be different circumstances. You may not be at all like John Newton, 
But the Bible, no, the Bible teaches that without Christ you're a lost soul. You're a sinner. But you can be found today by Jesus. You can experience salvation that comes through the amazing grace of God. The Bible says all you have to do is declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. It says you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. I encourage you to do that today. I encourage you to reach out in faith right now. As I lead you in prayer, I, I'm going to ask you to repeat a prayer after me. Ask Jesus into your life right where you are. If you do that today, and I pray you do, then please let us know so we can help you, encourage you, and counsel you, and pray with you. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you for Jesus who come, came to reveal your grace to us, who expressed your grace by dying on the cross, and you rose again, guaranteeing us our salvation. I pray if there's one listening today, they will pray this prayer if they don't know you as their Savior. Lord, I'm a sinner. I recognize my need of a Savior. I believe Jesus is my Savior. I believe He died and rose again. I confess with my mouth that He is Lord. I believe in my heart what Your Word says about Him. And I invite Him to come and to cleanse me from my sin today. I repent of my sin. Lord, help me now. Give me the grace that I need to serve you the rest of my days in Jesus' name. Father, I pray that those who have prayed that prayer today, that you would minister to them by your precious Holy Spirit. Help them and strengthen them in their new walk with you. In your name we pray. Amen. Folks, thank you so much for joining us again today. It's a privilege to come to you. What an opportunity we have to come to you by way of the internet, by way of television today. This building is empty because of COVID-19. But we're not stopping uh, declaring the good news of the gospel, the amazing grace of God. And my prayer, our prayer, is that you'll experience that amazing grace for yourselves today. In Jesus' name. Bless you. Until next time, may God minister to you, richly bless you and keep you, and give you strength and give you hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom.
the Spirit of the Lord is. There is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. 